Are we recording? Okay, good. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's time to get started again. Uh, last week, we finally wrapped up Psalm 22, which um, pretty good little study in that psalm. There's a lot to uh, learn, a lot to glean there. Speaking of a lot to learn and a lot to glean, what did you learn and glean from the last, last half of the chapter of Psalm 22? Sister Donna. Yeah, we talked a lot about, specifically verse 19 where it says that he requested strength, probably strength for his flesh, because I, I, I don't believe Jesus' spiritual resolve was ever was ever in question or in doubt. Uh, I don't think his fleshly resolve was ever in question or in doubt, but there are limitations to this, um, of which Jesus knew all too well. Yeah, yeah. He, he, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think at any moment did he think, you know, this is not such a good idea. But, but he, he had to experience all that, and he knew where, how far the flesh could go, and, and that he knew that this could not carry him, save by, by the strength of God. Uh, we also talked about the temptation that he faced on Calvary, the come down from the cross, and, um, and we will all believe. Um, kind of underlined in verse, um, let me look here, uh, I forget which verse it was now, I'm looking, I'm looking down through here, um, Anyway, I, th- I think maybe verse verse twenty one was the, was the verse that we kind of gleaned that from. But uh, anything else, brother Jarrett? Yep. Uh. Everyone that has, uh, yeah, everyone that's ever been saved has not, uh, has never, has not kept themselves. Uh, we were, were delivered and brought by the, uh, by the price that is elicited in this, in this chapter. Anything else? We had talked about that, yep. The easier, uh, well, it's it's outlined fairly fairly closely in the scripture the that broad is the way that leads to destruc- destruction it's it's an easy wide boulevard that's uh full of places that you can go down you can swerve from side to side you can go at your own pace you can speed up you can slow down you can do whatever you want uh but narrow is the way that uh, leads to eternal life any other? Wrapping up Psalm 22, we come to, I would venture to say, is the most well-known psalm in all of Scripture. Um, it is well-known enough that it is co-opted in decorative art. <laughs> it is well-known enough that it is used for... Um, uh literature and 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 stuff that ha- doesn't have anything to do with the scripture at times it can be it will be used in that in in that uh, in that place uh, yep yeah, funerals it, 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 it is it, it is it is used in a myriad of different ways but there's there's a lot of a lot of truth I don't know that I'm going to tell you anything that you haven't already heard before uh, but hopefully we can bring out some uh, new ideas on this. This is a very interesting psalm too, because um, first of all, it, it from what I can tell, there is not a timeline given to this, and it's very pastoral. This entire psalm relating 
us as sheep and Christ as a shepherd, which is something that David was highly familiar with. This is this is a psalm of this is a psalm of rest. This is a psalm of assurity, and this is a psalm that um, guides us to where we can find more peacefulness in our life. So Psalm 23, first verse, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I did, did a little bit differently than what I usually do. I usually don't read the entire psalm before we get into it, but um, you take a tone from, from this psalm. This psalm is is supposed to be a a great comfort. And I think one of the reasons that it's quoted so much is it even in the reading, it lilts like a song. It it, it is it is very poetic. It is it is it is, it is peaceful in its telling and it does offer spiritual comfort. The first verse cl- proclaims the Lord is my shepherd, recognition of a very, very specific office. Now David was all too aware of what that he was saying when he recognized uh, the Lord as a shepherd, and this is a a office. This is a place. This is a this is a personage that that Jesus himself bought. He he paid for the right to have his flock. He paid in blood. He paid in he he he, he, he paid in pain. He paid in misery, uh, and and. He he arose to cash the check, if you will be. He um, inherent with the office. See, and this is another thing. Jesus, in that he has a flock now, that that he paid for the flock, that he that 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 he ransomed this people unto himself. He inherently by the office of you know we we think a shepherd that means you're you're above all the other rest. But and yes, that does hold you to a certain standard, but it also indicates certain fulfillment that Jesus is required of as a shepherd. We don't often think about our God being re- things being required of him. But when he when he assumes these offices, just like he assumed that I am going to go, I am going to pay, and all shall be upon me. Nobody helped Jesus with his final sacrifice. Nobody, no, nobody, nobody bore any minute amount of that pain to help him. He took all upon himself. So when, when our God takes upon himself an office, a covenant, you can look a lot in the Old Testament and look at covenants. He, he literally signed contractual obligations with human beings. If you do this... I will do that. And by taking the office of shepherd, by being a shepherd, and this is not the only, you know, the Old Testament's not the only place that indicates him as a shepherd. There's, there's, there's a lot about, uh, the, the, you know, I, I'm the door to the sheepfold. And, 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 and he, he, he indicates himself as this, as this typology many times. And by doing that, he is responsible for the flock. What were the responsibilities of ancient shepherds? If David is the one making this comparison, the Lord is my shepherd, then we must assume that David knew what a shepherd was. David was a shepherd boy, and there were jobs of ancient shepherds. Basically, it was three major things. You had to keep the flock intact, i.e., none of them are ever going to escape None of them are ever going to get gone. He doesn't have a hundred sheep one morning and wake up and find out there are eighty and not wonder what happened to them. Not try to prevent, uh, not try to go out and seek them. The second is protection from predators. It is the shepherd's job to defend the flock. And finally, it is guidance. Whether this is to 
to lead them to places to eat, to lead them to market, to be sheared, to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, if, if, if they're upon a rocky precipice, to make sure that their feet stand sure and they all make it safely. It is the shepherd's job to guide the sheep. And Jesus does fulfill all these roles. Specifically, when we think about keeping the flock intact, there are so many directions that we could go with this. The, the analogy to an actual shepherd is endless. He keeps us intact as, as in, as one of his sheep. You're never going to all of a sudden not be one of his sheep. Right. Eternal security of the believer is inherent in him being our shepherd because he, just as a shepherd, seeks never to lose a member of his flock, our Lord will never lose a member of his flock. When a, in keeping a flock intact, if one should go astray, which is within the ability of the sheep, is to wander. It is his duty to go out and seek you. This is outlined fairly quickly, uh, fairly uh, readily in Matthew chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them goeth astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which has gone astray, and if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety-nine which had which went not astray. Even so, even so is it is not the will of our Father which is in heaven that one of these should one of these one of these little ones should perish. Right. Jesus, his ever watchful job is to is to maintain the integrity of this of this flock to and 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 we see that in our own lives and usually it comes in this form you astray and you receive chastisement we're going to and we've already read it we're going to get to thy rod and thy staff they comfort me um when a shepherd loses a sheep he reprimands the sheep right. that went astray he is glad that he found the sheep he is happy that he found the sheep. He, is, he rejoices that he finds the sheep. But oftentimes, ancient shepherds will break the legs of a sheep and then carry it on its shoulders until it is well to teach the sheep, you are an invalid without me, you have no ability without me, and you must take punishment for trying to stray without me. Keeping the flock intact. Jesus does this each and every day for each and every one of us uh, on an eternal scale and, and much, you know, on a much smaller, you know, uh, us seeking our own way type of uh, scale. Protection from predators, I think, is, is, uh, is one that uh, is also fairly closely outlined in Scripture. You can look at the story of Job. Have you considered my servant Job? I mean, how, how can I? You have this hedge about him. I, I, can't, I can't get in to where he's at. The Bible says uh, in, in, in uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, for your, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It is the shepherd's job, and Brother Larry, I think you could also be paying attention to this part, the under-shepherd's job to look for external threats. That doesn't lay everything at Brother Larry's feet. I am not, I am not letting you all opt out of, you know, uh, the, the Bible's very clear about watching. Uh, but it is the job of the shepherd, and by extension, the under-shepherd, look around. Pay attention. In fact, if you look at, at, at wild herds of animals, because, Brother Larry, even though you're the under-shepherd, you're also a sheep. But if you look at wild herds of animals, there's usually a couple of large males that are watching. While all the others are have their heads down and grazing, they're looking around, checking around, and the minute they see something wrong, they make a noise and the entire herd moves out. It is the, the job of the shepherd to protect. David of himself claimed that he killed both a, a lion and a bear to protect the sheep. We have the ultimate protection in the ultimate creator of the universe. If, if, you, think that, if you think that in the person that is charged himself with your caretaking is also the person that Every external threat that you can ever perceive 
He is the author and creator of it. That should bring us great comfort. That should bring us great, uh, uh, great joy. And finally is guidance. And we're not going to get too deeply into guidance right here because we're fixing to get into a lot about the guidance of the Lord in the, in the, preceding, in the preceding verses. Um, but uh, he is, it is very clear in Scripture, and, and we are going to get to some of it, but I, I want to elaborate further in the other verses that kind of deal more with this guidance. Um, but he is, is one that lends us a hand, that, that, that shows us the path. Uh, that that uh, that brings us in, and then in verse two, he maketh me. Uh, oh, verse I, I forgot the last part of verse one. Uh, I sh- I shall not want. So we have this shepherd, and then he makes the he makes the proclamation because because of be uh, be you know uh, by the nature of the preceding words, because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is in the very nature of a man to desire greater and greater and bigger and bigger things. In fact, it is the root of our fall. You will become as gods, knowing good and evil. Greed for power, desire for things that we're not allowed to have. The, the, the Garden of Eden was full of every good tree that was good for, for food, God, God literally cultivated a special place, that, and he said, all of it you can have, up to and including the tree of life. The tree of life was not off limits. You go back and read that. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil you're not allowed to eat from. The one thing in the entire garden we couldn't have is the one we couldn't keep our hands off of. It is in our very nature to desire things that we cannot have. So to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is, is no small thing. There is satisfaction found in the Lord. There is, um, and I honestly think it is an earmark of spiritual well-being that you can be content with what you have, yep. both 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 spiritually and physically. It is it is it is it is very it is very disconcerting to me when you see when you see Christians that flit from one thing to the next thing, and they're always searching, they're always looking, they're always desiring something else and seemingly never able to find it. That's a restless spirit that, that is an unguided spirit at the very least, and, and it makes you wonder about the, 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 the quality of their profession. Because contentment, uh, the, the Bible says, uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. The ability to say, the Lord is enough. Because I have this shepherd, someone who, as we've just already already enumerated, gives us a wealth of benefits, I don't need anything else. I am satisfied. There's a, I'm, I'm one of them, so I'll go ahead and say there are a lot of overweight Baptist people. And we continue to eat past the, the point of need because our brains, it's not your stomach, our brains are not satisfied. But to be, to be content with God is just to de- literally detach yourself from your flesh and say, I have everything I need already. Would it be nice to be driving around in, you know, instead, of, instead of an older pickup truck to be driving around in a newer pickup truck? It would be awesome. But I, I don't need that. I, I don't desire that. I, I, that. That should not be my daily drive. If, if things or work or family, I mean, I, I, and, and the Bible's pretty clear about this. If you, if you leave not father and mother and, and wife and children and follow after me, you cannot be my disciple. And, and, and I'm telling you, if, you're, if, if all you ever study on is, is things and, 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 and work and friends and family, you can't. You literally, actually, cannot be focusing on God. You're not satisfied. You're not content. Last thing with recognizing the Lord as our shepherd, and honestly, this is my largest point, so I don't think it's going to be this long for every single verse. Um, <laughs> um, in recognizing the Lord is our shepherd, what then do we that must we realize about our ourselves? If He is our shepherd, what are we? We're sheep. 
Sheep are subservient to the shepherd. Sheep are, 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 are underneath the shepherd. But sheep have a very, very specific role for the shepherd. Remember what I said about you know covenants in the Old Testament? They're contractual obligations. Why, why did mankind, and this is just a history lesson, let's see if we can get a hand in here, why did mankind start herding sheep in the first place? Larry. Wool. Yeah, I didn't realize this until I started doing some extensive study. I have milked goats. I did not know that there were milk sheep out there. Uh, apparently you can milk sheep. I don't want to drink sheep milk, but <laughs> that, that is a thing. You can get m- milk and meat and wool. There's a lot of things. And, and if you're a Jew, they, they make a fine sacrifice as well. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with sheep. We cultivate, we started as a mankind to cultivate sheep. Why? Because it was beneficial to us. Why does the Lord assume the role of shepherd? Well, He cares about us. He wants to tend us. He wants to make us uh, wholly His. He wants, to, he wants to guide us. He wants to lead us. He wants to watch the flock grow. But at the end of the day, He's going to guide us down to the market and have us sheared because that also makes Him happy. The work and us returning everything that he puts into us back as something glorifying to him. The wool, if you will. We, 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 we take everything he invested into us, and although it's piddling and probably small in comparison to all that he's done for us, we turn and we, and we literally take our own skin and our, our, our own, our own and, and this is yours. This is all yours. This is the work of your hands. We, we didn't do anything for it. Do sheep do anything to grow their wool other than wander around and, and just wait around for it to happen? No. Wool happens naturally for them. And just in the same way, just in the same way, uh, Jesus is, is, is tending and cultivating it, and, and, and all the things that, that come out of us are simply an extension of the work of his hands. And it comes back, and that is very, and you know, if it's a man, if it's a person, you know, a, a, a shepherd on, on a human level, he's very pleased by the money that he's going to gain from that wool. And on a, very, on a spiritual level, Jesus is very pleased when he sees the work of our hands and says, this is good. So you have this you have this obligation in this shepherding. It's not just it's not just this one sided thing. Well, he's going to tend us, and then we're going to do whatever we want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside still waters. The sustenance that we desire and that we need come in two different forms. In this, he says, green pastures and still waters. We can rest in the promises and in the truth and in the sustenance of the Scripture. This is more than one occasion in the New Testament referred to as bread. This is, this, is, this is our sustenance. These are the green pastures. And more than that, it says that he, he, uh, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. This isn't, an op- this isn't optional. You want to grow as a sheep? Do you want to get nice and fat and woolly and ready for being sheared? ground yourself down in the food source. You will not be able to grow as a sheep if every Sunday you come and you read your Bible and Brother Larry preaches a sermon and then you um, put my finger here, then you close it up and I'm done for a week. Or worse yet, you don't do any of that. If the only sustenance that you get is here, that's pretty bad. That's a poor diet. But at least it's something. Christians need to be fed. Sheep need to be fed. I have raised goats. I have raised sheep. If you don't feed them, they will die. And Christians, on the very same level, they'll begin to doubt. They'll begin to worry. They'll begin to wonder if they're even if if if, if the Lord's even among them anymore. You want to know why? Because they're they're literally spiritually starving to death. They have to eat. So he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He literally leads the sheep out to the... And this is where you're resting. This, and, and honestly, this is where you find peace. Rest is peace. Rest is safety. Rest is comfort. You can find all of that right here. We, we look in the Scriptures, and often, and I think it's because we, we don't follow the Scriptures, we look in the Scriptures, and oftentimes we find a mirror that points out all of our flaws. Right. But if we get our flaws straightened out, then we could look in the scripture and find comfort there, <laughs> you know. Uh, if, if, if you can, if you can get past all the rough points that are not your not not the the words problem, it's your problem. Right. 
then there's great comfort to be gained in here. Loved ones sick, there's a lot of about stuff, the loved ones being sick in the Bible. Uh, 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 low on money, there's a lot of stuff about people being poor and destitute and needy in the Bible. Uh, you, 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 you're, 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 having, you're having family trouble, there's a lot of counsel about relationships in the Scriptures. You can find comfort, you can find peace and rest, but you have to eat. You know, you know what the old saying is, you can leave a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? The Lord will lead us. He will make us lay down in these green pastures. But you don't have to eat. All of us have a Bible in our home. I, I would venture to say all of us have more than one Bible in our home. I know I have this Bible. I have the digital Bible on my phone. I have a little pocket Bible that I keep beside. I have, I have like at least four Bibles that I know actually where they're at right now. But none of those Bibles are useful if I never open them. You can, you can lead a sheep to the pasture, but you can't make him graze. You've got to eat. Finally, still waters. The, uh, Jesus referred to himself before the Samaritan woman as living water. Does that mean that we're going to have to you know, continually to sup on Jesus to stay saved? No. But there is a peaceful communion a uh, refreshing and a cleansing to our soul, drinking and communing with our Lord in the person of the Holy Spirit, just just drinking Him in, filling up on filling up on. It's 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 a wash. It's a cleansing. It's a refreshing. When you have the Spirit come by, you are renewed. It says that He's he, He's He's living water. There's vitality there. There's peace there. Communion with the Holy Spirit will bring you a lot of peace. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He restoreth my soul calls to my mind David's own request in, uh, in the Psalms, restoring to me the joy of my salvation. Sin, sorrow, time spent without, so many things draw us away from the Lord. And I, I don't think that we need soul restoration in the, in the fact that, well, you need to be saved again, Brother Larry. I don't, there's, I, I don't, if you're already a sheep, you're already a sheep. There's, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not all of a sudden, although there are, in this day and age, there are people that believe this, I'm not all of a sudden morphing into a goat because I have spent a certain amount of time away. No, I am still a sheep, but we need soul restoration. I don't think David was lost when he said, restoring to me the joy of my salvation. This is a call back. This is a remembering. This is, this is, this is, this is a turning back and, 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 and sitting down and, and looking at our past, looking at our future, looking at where we're going, and, and getting this getting this community. And, and, and it's not something that you can do. You can seek, you can knock, you can pray, you can beg, you can plead, but it doesn't say you restore your soul. It says, He restoreth my soul. That means very similarly to the way that you're saved, he is in control of the tap on, on soul restoration. We get tarnished, we get beat up, we get, um, we get run down, but it takes restoration. I, I don't know, I, every now and again, I don't know how, why I do this, but every now and again, you, there, there's, a, there's a Facebook video feed. And somehow I've watched enough videos on this Facebook video feed that I've curated myself. It like brings up these restoration videos a lot where uh, some guys take it. It's usually like an old rusty axe head or something. And then at the end of the video, it's like he, he's using it to chop wood. And you're like, that's amazing how, how you did that. Uh, you know, and he does all this, all this work to it and uses, used all this stuff. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, and, and it burns a lot of time whenever we're sitting around in the barbershop. So, um, the, um, but if I was a rusty old axe head in the soul, you know, at one time I was useful. At one time I was uh, uh, vital. Uh, and, and, and honestly, being a worn out rusty axe head does not make me any less of an axe head. It just makes me unuseful. But an axe head, if anybody here has ever picked one up, they definitely don't have any ability of their own. They definitely don't have any power of their own. In fact, 
uh, separate and apart you picking them up off the ground, they will lay there and rust away to nothing. But if a diligent owner of an axe head takes and I don't know what chemical they use, probably some type of acid, but it takes and they dip, dip that axe head in this acid and it removes a lot of the rust and they put it on the, the buffer machine and they start running that rust off of there and you start seeing that gleam underneath. And uh, a lot of times on these videos, they'll, if there was some like special detail, they'll go ahead and they'll restore the, the, the carving, make it look all pretty again. And then they'll get a new axe handle, and they'll put that in there, and they'll, they'll do all the work. They'll, they'll, they'll make the wood swell, and they'll put an insert in the top of it. And at the end of the video, it's ready for use again. Was any of that on the axe head? Also, was the axe head at any point ever a hammerhead in that description? No, the axe head was always a hammerhead, and you're always a sheep. You're always saved. You always, but, but sometimes we need restoration. Sometimes we need the, the good Lord. We're, we're old, we're tired, we're beaten down, and, and a lot of it, the rust and corrosion that we find in ourselves is our own doing. But whether it be by time or, 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 or negligence or our own actions, we need the Lord to reach down and... Perform a restoration on us. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. The second verse, the second half of this verse leads us back to the first verse with one of the responsibilities of the shepherd to guide his sheep. The narrow way is hard to find. Inherently, the narrow way is hard to find. Trackers that are familiar with wilderness woods and stuff, they get on these game trails, and they know the difference between a game trail and just some wide spots and some, some tufts of grass. They know the path, and sometimes the narrow path is hard to find. But Jesus leads the way, giving spiritual guidance, guidance all down the path. Psalm 19, 105 states, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And why should we follow this rough and narrow and, 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 and tough way? It winds, it, it, go, it probably goes in dangerous places, and if, in a second we're going to find out where it ultimately, the veil of which it ultimately leads this narrow path. Why, what is the point of following? Well, verse, th uh, 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 verse 3 answers itself. For His name's sake. 2 Timothy 2.20 mentions vessels to honor. And it is the goal and purpose of us to follow the path and serve as intended to bring what? To bring honor to our God. Why do we choose this path? Well, verse 3 answers its own question. It answers that question perfectly. It says, for his namesake. Why do we take the rough road? Because he took a far rougher one for you. And it makes him happy not to see you suffer, not to see you to see you struggle, but to see you try. To give a little back. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. The ultimate end of this narrow path of course, is the ultimate end of the broad path as well. Honestly, uh, if you want a wagon wheel theory, all roads do lead to one place, and that is death. We all must face it. We all must, we all must in interface with it eventually. A hundred percent of people that have ever lived on this earth, including our dear Lord, died. All of them. And we find the psalmist... coming to this place, and seemingly there's no fear. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Has his pace changed? Has his, um, has his composure tilted? Does he beg for mercy in fear of death? No. A high head is held. A careful step is taken, and on into the valley of the shadow of death. But why? Why does the psalmist seem 
seem to be able to feel the ability to, in the actual face of death, stand tall and walk hand in hand with our Lord right down to the bottom? Well, it's not called the valley of death. No, no, the psalm is very clear. It's called the valley of the shadow of death. Paul says it best in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 53 through 55, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible hath put on incorruption, and this mortal hath put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Why is it not scary? Because it is a mere shade of what it once was. For the saved, this only goes out to you, it is a shadow. It is the briefest moment. It, it, it is the, I don't know if any of you ever jumped off a bridge into water. I did one over in Bumpus Mills. It was the scariest thing of my life. I'm never doing it ever again. Um, but there is a moment before you hit the water where you take that influx of air, before you hit that cold old spring water. And then once you're down there, you think, I survived. My skin tingles, but it was, it was good. And it, the shadow of death will be just like that. You'll take a breath, and one minute you'll breathe here, and there'll be an instant of pain, and you will breathe a sigh on glory's side. Why? Because death is swallowed up in victory. He goes on to say, For thou, uh, uh, for thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now this almost seems out of place, but honestly I think this is the man who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death is a look back. He's holding on to the hand of the Lord because he says that thou art with me. There's no, there's no fear left because why should there be? You're going on to, uh, uh, you're going on to interface directly with the shepherd. And then he calls back to the rod and thy staff, they come from me. I think this is them looking back and thinking, you, you know, there are people that get close to death and, you know, I'm not sure if I'm saved or not and whatnot. But the, the writer of the psalm looks back and says, you know what? The Lord has whipped me. The Lord has caught me. And some, you know, there, there, there are two instruments here, the rod and the staff. The rod is for correction. The staff is for protection and, and, and safety. It's, it's literally the, the shepherd's crook. You know what the shepherd's crook was for? It was to reach out and take small sheep that were in danger, pull them back to himself. And the psalmist is looking back as we're going through the valley of the shadow of death and as we're approaching end of life, and he looks back at everything that he, that, that's happened to his life, and there is no doubt in his safety as he steps forward. Why? Because... Well, Hebrews 6.16 6, 16, uh, 16, 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son when he receiveth. You know why I know that I am Larry Lafferty's son? Because Larry Lafferty whipped me whenever I was a child. Nobody else whipped me. Larry Lafferty whipped me, and Donna Lafferty whipped me. That's how I know they're my parents. They're also the ones that taught me and gave me, and gave me correction and instruction. And in this moment, this final moment, as the psalmist is nearing toward the end of life, he looks back and says, I don't have any fear because, I'm hold first of all, I'm holding on to the hand of my father, and I know for sure I have a firm hold because he's held me all the way, every way. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Nothing is hurried. There's no confusion no disturbance. The enemy is at the door, and yet God prepares a table. And the Christian sits down and eats as if there's no problem. I think this honestly goes back to, again, the roles of the shepherd that we see in that is com compacted in the Lord is my shepherd when he says that he is a protector of the sheep. The wolf can circle the flock as many times as he wants, but as long as the shepherd's there, it doesn't matter. We're still going to lean, sit down in green pastures and eat. Do we have to ready ourselves for battle? You know, if, if there's an enemy on this doorstep, if a soldier gets to eat it all, it's an MRE and it's a, it's a, it's a hurried meal. But we don't even see that mirrored in, in this verse. 
there's a preparation that prepares the table before me. There's time given to the to the, the to the intricacy, to, to the decoration, to the you know. If you ever watch those, those those crazy cooking shows where they they do all the, like the artistry with the food, and then they like for whatever reason take sauce and like smear it on half the plate, um, and, and and it's supposed to be you know real pretty. But but that's kind of what he's indicated that preparation, the attention to detail. There's no hurry. There's no worry about an enemy on the doorstep. Why? Because the enemy is. Not, not a problem. Right. The enemy, the, the enemy is the enemy is a uh, is is an afterthought. Sit down and eat. Enjoy comfort. Enjoy in, enjoy enjoy the uh, time here. And then the in, the end of the verse here, where it says, um, um, "Thou anointest my head with oil; my cup runneth over." Um, sets apart the Christian for a priesthood. It's it is it is a literal setting apart when we anoint someone when we when when someone you know the Bible and especially in the Old Testament is mine anointed why that that's something someone specifically cho- chosen and we uh, we are called a royal priesthood this is a blessing for the work that we're setting out to do we're we, you know we're we're fed we're anointed we're we're blessed and then at the end of the verse there is a an expulsion of, of emotion, I think. My cup runneth over. The, the blessings that he has received surpass satisfaction. They go, they go beyond need. They go beyond want. The blessing that the Lord intones for, for the people that do his work. Now, again, we're talking about contractual obligation. To, for him to be the shepherd, you must be the sheep. And sheep make wool. They're designed for a very specific purpose. And I'm going to refuse to believe that sheep milk is a thing. They're made for wool. <laughs> and in all that we are promised in Psalm 23, the psalmist says we're blessed beyond compare. We're, we're, we're blessed not, 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 to, not to the filling up where you have a good glass full, not to, oh, it's brimming on the top, and if I, if, I, if I canter my cup either way, it's going to slosh out. No, it is overflowing. It is running down the sides. It is, it, 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 it is dripping onto the saucer and filling the saucer. I think this fullness is closest mirrored. And if, if you want to know what the being full of the joy and the blessing of God is like, look back to your own salvation, the moment of your conversion. Never are you more full or overflowing. It runs out of you just like snot out of your nose. Verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The everlasting blessing of the Lord's sa- uh, salvation Grace and care is guaranteed in the word surely. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Look at the life of Joseph. Did surely goodness and mercy follow him all the days of his life? Reading the entire story, yes. Yes, it does. In the moments where Joseph was alone and when he was at the bottom of a pit, scared, was surely in goodness and mercy there, I don't know what Joseph was feeling. I bet it was alone. I bet it was scared. When Joseph was sold to the Midianites, was surely goodness and mercy following in them? Yes, but we, we, ha- we have an omniscient third-person view that we can look at the entire story. I bet it was pretty scary. When he was sold into Potiphar's house, was surely in goodness and mercy there? Well, yeah, he prospered in Potiphar's house. Oh, But what about when his wife accused him of rape? Was surely goodness and mercy there? And on and on we could go. See, surely goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life does not mean that everything's a bed of roses. But ultimately, where did Joseph end up? He was the right-hand man of the king. And I think that's what's kind of mirrored in this last verse. And the, the, the eternity of our blessing is secured with, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just like Joseph being the right-hand man to the Pharaoh or the king. It's all you save people. We're joint heirs. Kings and queens as well. Maybe we only get to be dukes and stuff, but that's okay. We're part of the royal family. 
Psalm 23 is, 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 is deeper than, I think, the media and the um, watered-down nature of the take of this psalm actually lets on. Are there any questions? Yes. Are there any questions or comments on Psalm 23? All right. Yeah, I have heard that. True. There's nothing else. We'll let y'all go. Y'all have a great week. Thank you.